Sanitize and our development. And by that, we mean what that means is not just saying we will mainstream it. The most important thing we now need is strength of political will. I think we understand the immense risks of climate change. We understand the scale of economic change we need to make. That is essentially a new energy and industrial revolution. In the case of industrial revolutions in the past, there have always been dislocations. There have always been people who oppose change. You should not dismiss that. You should recognise that dislocation is involved. You should recognise that some energy prices will have to go up. And you have to deal with that change. We need to accelerate the pace of the new industrial revolution that is taking place right now. This industrial re revolution is moving in the direction of green technologies, uh, green energy, cleaner technologies in various production processes, but also in infrastructure, housing and transportation. Accelerating that pace will keep us below two degrees. It will also reduce emissions and, in effect, promote growth and wealth creation in poorer countries. The main thing that we have to do in this next 20 year period is we have to mainstream this agenda. Just talking green, talking eco, talking clean, talking sustainable, you're always talking to the 10 or 15 percent who are already engaged. You're preaching to the choir and what we really need to do the next 20 years is broaden it and actually address that big chunk in the middle. You know, the 10 or 15 percent who want to resist, they'll resist. The deniers, the skeptics, the contrarians. But the big chunk in the middle is who we have to go after. Until they are engaged and acting and investing and making decisions that are in line with green growth, you can forget it. We need to climatize our development and by that we mean we need to ensure that we reduce our energy intensities in the future and we accelerate the growth of our green economies. We need new technology and new diplomacy. We already have some tremendous technologies to lower emissions that are not yet deployed. They're going to be deployed in the years ahead and going to make an amazing difference. But to get to the goals that are required to stabilize the global climate while growing the economy worldwide, we're going to need some breakthrough technologies. And for that, we need research and development around the world. We need the best minds in the world focused on this issue. We need financial capital and we need policy frameworks that bring forward the best technology. Smart policy can guide those existing cash flows to greener choices. And when I say smart policy, I mean taking advantage of what we've learned around the world. There turns out a very small number of very important policies make the difference. An example is fuel efficiency standards for cars. There's no reason every car made in the world shouldn't be super efficient, shouldn't get better than 50 miles per gallon or fewer than 95 grams of CO2 per kilometer. We have the technology and it's cost effective. But it won't happen unless the car companies are asked through smart policy to do so. To collaborate across sectors and across ministries, we need to strengthen the government business society interface and particularly to get the business sector on board by helping them to recognize that low emissions uh, policy is profitable for them to invest in. That is a uh, key. Uh, well, there is always a uh, low hanging fruit. And if you can show people that if you do this, here are your immediate gains, uh, and, and you can uh, track those gains from a financial or economic perspective, then people will want to change or people will change. In the current environment, because of the financial crisis, there has been, I think, a greater willingness to explore new approaches, and in that lies a tremendous opportunity on which we must capitalize. We need to have the political support at the highest level. In the case of Mexico, President Calderón declared the climate change issue as a national security issue. 
Second, to work in the national and international agenda. And to work in the national agenda means to work with the private sector, with the local governments, uh, with the society in general. And finally, the point is how to create the public the policies and to stop the uh, perverse incentives that sometimes do not cause progress, but at the same time destroy the environment and uh, cause a lot of emissions. We have to reduce the use of uh, fossil fuels. We have to also in, to agriculture and uh, forestry or so on in better ways. But directly or indirectly, that just means we have to change the structure of the, uh, the energy market as we have it. We know society in, in many cases where it's not just about the price, the existing signals in the economy, but they worry about quality of life. They worry about their children and grandchildren. That's why people invest in education, even elementary education. It won't pay off for for decades, and uh, parents are very willing to put the money anyhow. So that means that uh, there is a willingness to move beyond just the current price. And, uh, uh, but we need to do that in some sort of concerted way, creating consciousness that this is what needs to be done. But at some stage, it has to be a real uh, signal in the economy. It cannot be done just voluntarily. That's not efficient enough given the urgency of the problem. The problem is we can't ignore the very real necessity to move from about a billion or a billion and a half consumers of food and fuel who are currently consuming at middle class levels to five billion who have to develop to that same standard of living. We have to move toward a situation where we increase productivity especially the productivity we get from our natural resources that are consumed in the process of fuel, energy, or food, agriculture, that is gradually taking down the forest that become the lungs of the earth. So the answer is we must initiate what amounts to an industrial transformation comparable to what we have had since 1750 when the emissions, uh, when the Industrial Revolution began. We need leaders who take the trouble to understand the facts, who look in the eyes of their children and their grandchildren and act in a way that is in their best interests. Um, it's not cheap, but it's not expensive. World GDP is, what, $80 trillion? Probably $1 trillion of that will need to be spent to move towards a new direction. We don't know everything, but we certainly know enough to get to a path whereby world temperatures would not grow by more than two degrees. The good news is that there are such leaders in a growing number of countries around the world. There are not yet enough, but we believe with uh, hard work, with appropriate financing, we can cross a threshold.